Today we continue in the sutta exploration of the earliest discourses. During the last month or so, we've covered three of the earliest suttas in Lord Buddha's dispensation, namely the Dhamma Chakkapavattana, and in chronology, chronological order, uh, we also did the Hemavata, which was the last one we did. And then we also have done the Anatta Lakkana Sutta. And the Sutta that we'll cover today is the Aditta Pariyaya Sutta, which is the um, normally called the fire sermon, or everything is burning. Um, uh, that actually comes right after the Anatta Lakkana Sutta in its order. Um, so before diving in, I, I just wanted to mention a few things uh, to get a bearing, our bearings of, of what has been happening. And uh, because the last time we were there with Lord Buddha and the five disciples, we saw that the world had its first <laughs> six arahants, uh, with Lord Buddha being number six, and the other being the five group, a group of five disciples, all of whom became bhikkhus after hearing the Anattalakkana Sutta, listening to it um, as Lord Buddha talked and described functions of the non-substantiality of the sense of identity. Today's uh, sutta happens to be from the Sangyutta Nikaya again. Uh, these are interestingly enough, not at the very beginning of a major Nikaya, uh, a collection of discourses such as let's say the Diga Nikaya or long discourses or the Majjhima Nikaya, which is what most people get exposed to initially when they are studying the Dhamma. For some reason, they have not been placed in the uh, beginning, let's say, like the Mulapariyaya or the Brahmajala Sutta, as in the case of Diganikaya. But they are kind of tossed way out there in the vast forest that is the Sangyutta Nikaya, the connected or linked discourses. Um, so, but we hear about them, we know the context of it, but when we go looking for these suttas, they're not easy to find. They're almost, you know, not given that spotlight that you would see many of the other suttas, let's say the the uh, Satipatthana Sutta or the um, many of the other suttas. Um, um, there's so many. Anyhow, um, <laughs> basically, Today's sutta comes from Sangyutta Nikaya, and the number is 35.28. It is from the vast collection from the Sang uh, Sangyutta, and that is the Salayatana Sutta. And uh, uh, what it is, is basically, um, it falls, the Sangyutta Nikaya also has different branchings. And then we have the Sabba Vagga, which is uh, everything. Sabba means all or everything. The group on everything. Vagga means group. Um, and then you have the actual Sutta, Aditya Pariyaya Sutta. The discourse on everything is burning. Everything is burning. So after the Anattalakkana Sutta, we had the six Arahants. And then uh, we see as we look at the in the Vinaya text, because most of the background story we also get not just from commentaries, but a lot of it comes from the Vinaya, uh, like Mahavagga, for example, or the Chulavagga. So there we see how there was right after that incident of um, where we had the five bhikkhus becoming arahants, you have. Um, a young man, his name was Yasa, 
And he was also very wealthy. He was a son of a wealthy merchant. And uh, he also had three palaces uh, like Lord Buddha, like Siddhartha had. And uh, one night after a major party, he wakes up early in the morning and uh, he looks at all of his uh, party attendees, if you will. And they were all women musicians, all of whom were there to entertain him. And he sees them in not so appealing or attractive positions, meaning everybody's drooling, uh, sleeping and, and disorderly. And he's the only one who's awake. And he becomes disgusted by the fact of, well, so this was all a charade. Even though the night prior, he might've been burning with desires of all kinds. And he has the urge to get out of his palace. And he's wearing these very fancy slippers, uh, golden weaved and all that. Um, he's a, he's a well, you know, wealthy man's son. So he walks into the forest early in the morning and he comes across Lord Buddha. And he sees him and he takes off his slippers and he goes and sits in front of him, pays his respect and... Uh, Lord Buddha teaches him about um, progressive teaching um, and um, starting with, for example, generosity, and then how to improve one's uh, sila, and then uh, how to be reborn in a heavenly realm. Slowly, slowly, his consciousness, his awareness settles down because there was already Nibbida taking place or the disenchantment or disgust towards the six senses, suddenly he attains the first stage, Sotapanna. Meanwhile, his father comes in uh, because they're looking everywhere because the palace had woken up and they sent word that the prince is gone or the, the, the master of the, you know, has left and we don't know where he is. So everybody's panicking and his father goes out with a group and he's looking and he's, he finds his son's slippers following his footsteps. And Lord Buddha says, hmm, I think this would be a good opportunity to see if father and son could both develop in the Dhamma. So uh, he blocks the father's sight in a way where he cannot see his son who's sitting right there in front of him. And the man, the old man comes and he pays his respect and he sits down and he says, have you seen my son? He says, yes. Oh, the man relaxes suddenly that his son is not lost or killed by bandits, etc. So long story short, the father also becomes a Sotapanna. Meanwhile, as the son is listening, he becomes an Arahant. And Lord Buddha reveals him and then uh, the father is completely happy to see his son again. And his son right there and then uh, requests to become uh, ordained. So as it's, it's progressing, we have, uh, and then a whole group of uh, Yasa's friends come in, his mother and si uh, wife. Um, they also become Sotapanas, but most of the friends who come from Yasa's uh, uh, friend circle, they also become Arahants. Um, so the number grows exponentially. And then um, Lord Buddha, at that point, uh, once we have um, how many, 50 and then we have 60 uh, Arahants at that time, suddenly it grows pretty fast. And Lord Buddha at that point sends them off, each on his own, bhikkhus, all of whom are bhikkhus, uh, and he sends them off and he says, go and go forth and travel to places. And for the sake of the happiness and the welfare of the many, as bhikkhus, we give up things. We must sacrifice things. That comes with the title of a bhikkhu. Now, especially if the bhikkhus, like in this case, was uh, here with the 60 bhikkhus, um, 
they were all arahants. So that takes it to another level of giving up things. Um, so out of compassion for the world and the, for the happiness of gods and humans, go and, and spread the Dhamma. And uh, at that time, Lord Buddha even allows them to uh, give the Pabbaja and uh, uh, ordination to uh, the bhikkhus, to whomever comes in. And we had the triple gem at the time, because now we had the Sangha as well. We had the Buddha, and then we have the Dhamma, of course, and now we had the Sangha. So when a person simply took refuge in all three, that was their ordination. This was the earliest, earliest days. So we didn't have Vinaya as such, or uh, you know the rules, etc. So uh, after he sends them off, Lord Buddha uh, goes towards uh, Uruvela, and that is where he comes across the Kassapa brothers, who end up being um, basically the audience to whom Lord Buddha will give the discourse of the Aditya Pariyaya Sutta. And um, these uh, Kassapa brothers, uh, they um, were fire wor worshippers, or Jatila, they're called. Um, and um, they would worship the fire because it represents life. And so it was a very external presence. It was very factual. You, you touch your you touch the fire, you burn, but at the same time, you also have some fire in your digestive system, for example, which allows you to process food, gain nutrients from the food that you're eating. Without digestion, nothing happens. Life, the same thing with the with you know with the sun giving it, its heat, etc. So the examples uh, are many, of course, but this had. Uh, a divine element to it, especially. And they were so fixated on the fire worship. And the older brother, uh, Uruvela Kassapa, had about 500 disciples. Uh, the other brother, the, his name was, I believe, Nadi, Nadi Kassapa, uh, he had about 300 disciples. And then the youngest of all, Gaya Kassapa, was uh, the one who had 200. So all in all, they had a thousand disciples. So Lord Buddha, as uh, he was always, like, whenever he did, it did or said, said something, you know that there was an objective. <laughs> so he goes to Uruvela Kassapa's monastery and he says, may I have a place to rest? And Uruvela Kassapa looks at him and he says, I don't have any place for you. And he says, but there is that shrine room over there. And he says, well, that's where we have a beast, a, a Naga king. Uh, he's ferocious. You cannot be there. He'll kill you. And that's where we also keep the fire. He says, that's okay. I don't mind the <laughs> serpent king, the Naga king. He says, are you sure? He says, yes. So he allows him finally uh, to spend the night there. And Lord Buddha spends the night there, and in the morning he goes off on alms round. Uruvela Kassapa in the, at night hears all this noise, commotion, and fire coming out of the windows, things, and he goes inside. He's curious. He's thinking, the poor guy is dead. Nobody could survive that much, you know, fire and things. So he goes in and he sees this bowl-like thing that he had for the worship in the room in front of the fire and he opens it up and he sees that the king uh, naga king had turned into a tiny little docile snake curled up in itself coiled and um and he says ah this this uh, recluse gotama must be very powerful but he says he cannot be an arahant like me he cannot possibly as good as me. So meanwhile, Lord Buddha goes through these, you know, he stays there in that compound for a while. And every night almost, you have the Brahma gods come visit him. That Uruvela Kassapa sees all this light coming in out of the room where Lord Buddha is. And he says, wow, 
he must be very powerful to have all this because the next day he checks in and says, what was all that light all about? Like the lights coming in out of the sky into your kuti. And Lord Buddha says, the Brahma gods came in last night. The following day, Sakka came in and the man was seeing all these lights and things. So finally, he's every night meanwhile, he's saying, well, this Retrus Gautama is very powerful but he cannot be an arahant like me. So this goes on for a while until <laughs> Lord Buddha, I guess, gets fed up. And he says, uh, Uruvela, not only are you not an arahant, but you're not even on the road, on the path to becoming an arahant. But Uruvela, Kasapa, instead of sitting and debating with Lord Buddha to prove that, no, no, I am an Arahant. He realizes the futility of such an attempt because he knows that inside he's just empty. He has not reached any supramundane states. He's just been going through rites and rituals, despite the fact that they have been developing in meditation. Because this group of 1,000 uh, disciples we're going to see uh, were very dedicated to their practice. And um, so he says, well, I take refuge in the Buddha then. I would like to become your disciple. This is Uruvela, the eldest of all the brothers. And Lord Buddha says, well, that's a big responsibility. That's a big statement that you're making. Please go ahead and speak to your disciples first. See what they say. I doubt there's a teacher like that in the world today or any time in history, I've never come across such a teacher who would say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Even though the person has given his full submission, basically all his assets are now yours. But the Buddha turns him away and says, wait, go, go check with your own subordinates, your own students. And he goes and uh, the teacher says, uh, you know, I'm going to go and become a disciple of the rector Skotama. And they had already probably have heard and seen things about, you know, in, 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 in test, as testified by, by the facts, evidenced by the facts that they had seen. And they say, we're coming with you. So the 500 disciples go and become, along with their teacher, Uruve Lakasapa, the disciples of Lord Buddha. So as uh, is customary, they have to toss away all their own you know, uh, the things that they were using for their rites and rituals. So they tossed them away uh, into the river. Their outfits, their special paraphernalia for, for doing the worship, the fire worship. As the river brings down, down, down the river, basically, the, the, all these uh, equipment or things, clothing and furniture, whatever they were using, the Nadi Kassapa, the middle brother, sees all this and they get worried. Oh my God, what happened? We have to go and, and see all this. Did they die? Did they drown? So the 300 students and him, they head up to upstream and they find that all the 500 plus his brother had become bhikkhus. And they inquire and they, and they say, well, we want to become bhikkhus as well. So you had the 300 now becoming bhikkhus and they toss their stuff into the river and it goes downstream and, and the younger brother and his 200 disciples sees this and they go up and, and you know the rest. Uh, uh, they also become bhikkhus. Now you had 1000 bhikkhus in addition to the 60 that Lord Buddha sent out uh, on their uh, missionary work. So, but these 1,000 bhikkhus were not arahants. If you go away from like about maybe a few miles away out of the city of uh, Gaya, Bodh Gaya, you get to this hill. It's called Gaya Sisa Hill. I think it's now in, in uh, Hindus call it Brahmayoni uh, Hill. But it used to have a huge, huge boulder rock that's it's jutted out of the side of the hill. And it used to be, uh, according to commentaries, including Chinese explorers who went there, uh, 
centuries after the discourse, of course, uh, centuries before our time, and they had seen remnants of this. Um, uh, the, it, was, it was flat, the rock itself, they say it looked like the head of a, an elephant, and it was big enough to fit 1,000 bhikkhus. And that is where this uh, sutta is taking place. Uh, by the way, I've been to the place and it's a, it's a beautiful, uh, you get to see the whole valley, the Gaia uh, city, but only a portion, a small, small portion of the, of the rock is, is, is still there jutting out. The rest of it had collapsed, I guess, over the centuries. But you can sit down and meditate, especially at sunrise or sunset. It's quite a powerful place. So the theme of the sutta, the fire sermon, was no surprise, surprise in, in the fact that it was being picked by Lord Buddha for this specific audience, for this specific group of disciples, given the theme, given the value of emotional connection they had, spiritual connection, if you will, they had to this uh, topic of meditation, which is fire. It burns. So it was their center of attention for, how, I don't know however long it was, but that was their practice. So Lord Buddha gives another slant, a, a different version of fire. Instead of it being outside of their bodies, outside of their living experience, something external, he is going to bring it inward into their inner world and see the connection the fire has with their living experience, specifically with the um, six senses, the six sense doors and the six sense objects. So um, without further ado, let us begin. At one time, the Blessed One was staying near Gaya at Gaya Sisa Hill, along with his newly ordained 1,000 bhikkhus. There, the Blessed One addressed them by saying, bhikkhus, everything is burning. And what is this everything that is burning? The eye is burning, forms are burning, vision is burning, eye contact is burning, and whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of eye contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also is burning. As mentioned, this discourse is about the nature of the six sense organs, the six sense objects the six consciousnesses or sense awarenesses, meaning the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the, the, the body, and of, of course the mind, and their interactions, resultant interactions with the world, the contacts that we have, they're all burning. The eyes are burning with visual objects. There's this craving, but if the connection is severed, if, the cut, if there's a cut between the object being seen and the eye, then there cannot be eye consciousness taking place right after because of the joining of the two, because they're not joined, they're disjointed. It's like the fuel that gets to be cut from being, you know, supplying the further and further burning of the fire. So, But burning with what? They are all burning with the fires of passion, with the fires of hatred, and with the fires of delusion. I declare that they are all burning with the fires of birth, of getting old, and of the inevitability of death. Burning with all kinds of strife, suffering, troubles, sorrow, depression, and anguish. Similarly, the ear is burning Sounds are burning, hearing is burning, ear contact is burning, and whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of ear contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also is burning. But burning with what? They are all burning with the fires of passion, with the fires of hatred, and with the fires of delusion. I declare that they are all burning with the fires of birth, of getting old and of the inevitability of death. 
burning with all kinds of strife, suffering, troubles, sorrow, depression, and anguish. Our economy is all based on the six senses, isn't it? Advertisements all have to function on creating this burning, this fire, whether it's through sounds, through sights. They have all these psychological and devious tricks that they play on our attention to grab hold of our essentially our opinions, our judgment, and our decision-making power, which basically is no power at all because they are basically coaxing us, corralling us like a herd of cattle or sheep to go ahead and, and, and do this, buy this, buy the new iPhone, buy the new things, go and watch this new brand new movie. You have to get this outfit for this season because it is in. Well, how would I know about this outfit if I didn't have any Facebook? I was not, I didn't have a TV to watch, to see. I noticed this years ago when I used to buy DVDs, Disney DVDs for my uh, young nephews when they were born. So I would, you know, once they were able to understand a few things, so I would get these new, you know, Lion King and things like that. But something interesting I noticed. Before the movie started, there would be a slew of advertisements right there before the kids get to see what they were hoping to see. Before the movie, the animation started, they would see the up and coming other DVDs that are on their way. And now I had, thanks to those advertisements, my nephews coming and saying, uncle, when are you gonna buy this for me? But it was like, oh boy. And they weren't expensive in those. I mean, they were expensive in those days, the DVDs when they first came out. And, you know, events and things and, and going to this place and that. From a very beginning, we are being led by the fires. In fact, they are fanning the flames, the world that we live in, thanks to the six senses. We're always on the lookout of the newest thing. And, you know, it's no surprise that psychologists are on the payroll of big companies. Every single advertising agency, every single major cons cons consultancy group has to have some psychologists on their payroll because those are the ones who are actually using the fires of, to get people to be enticed. The colors, uh, most people don't know about the colors that McDonald's has, Burger King has, in and out in other fast food places. Why is it red and yellow, for example? The colors that they have. Well, they know that one color promotes uh, the appetite and the other color actually promotes you to move fast and get out of there as soon as possible meaning there's a very quick circulation you're in you eat you go you're in you're in you go you're not going to sit there like a nice cafe or a, a, a restaurant for hours they can't make money or the color pink you put a very angry child in a room that is painted in pink, suddenly the anger will drop. They do this in, in high security uh, prisons sometimes with uh, violent inmates, for example. So the senses, the six senses are always picking up. They're always burning. And 26 centuries ago, Lord Buddha saw this. By the way, the Irish poet T.S. Eliot also uh, used this, uh, um, the, the parable or allegory of the uh, Aditya Pariyaya in one of his uh, books, um, works, I think it's called The Wasteland from the 1920s. Uh, so let's go back to this. Similarly, the nose is burning, odors are burning, smelling is burning nose contact is burning. 
And whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of those contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also is burning. But burning with what? They're burning with the fires of passion, fires of hatred, the fires of delusion. I declare that they are all burning with the fires of birth, of getting old, of the inevitability of death, burning with all kinds of strife, suffering, troubles, sorrow, depression, and anguish. We have the sense organ. It's called the ajhata. And then we have the, their, their objects, the bahidha. And you bring them together, you have sense awareness or consciousness, vinyana. And because they have all these three coming together, then you have pasa or the contact, the response to the stimuli. And because of this cycle, boom, you have Vedana, feeling. Feelings have a burning nature to them. Agni or Aditta, as used in the Pali here, is that burning, that flame, which can also be another way of saying papanchas, which we've come across in the Madhupindika, the honeyball discourse in the Majjhima Nikaya a few months back. Oftentimes we are looking for experiences, whether it's seeing a certain visual object, a scene, hearing a certain sound, a certain music, being touched in a certain way, smelling something, etc or thinking about a pleasant thought or a memory, not because or the, for the sake of the seeing of the object. Because you can go and see, let's say, uh, Eiffel Tower, let's say, if that has moved you in Paris. And then you go there some years later and, and you put all that money in and you go and you're like standing there, not to see the Eiffel Tower, but to recapture, re-experience that feeling that the first encounter had brought inside of you that resulted at that moment. The feeling is what we're after. But before we get to the feeling, we have to also acknowledge the other factors, the other substances, the fuel sources that are coming in to keep the fire of this feeling going. So in that sense, there's a lot of craving attached to this feeling phenomenon, as we see here being uh, described as Lord Buddha is saying it, it, it has the three defilements, burning with lust, burning with hatred, aversion, and burning with, uh, with, with, with delusion. These three are what are guiding us as we go. Advertising agencies, when I just mentioned them, but or, or movies, I've always wondered ever, ever since I was a child, when you watch a movie, there's always the protagonist and antagonist, always. Why? Why does there always have to be a bad guy? Like, especially in the mythological figures or Disney and things like that. Why does it always have, don't they go home? Don't they have their loved ones? Are they always bad, basically? But it won't sell. It won't grab me as a child, as a person. There has to be a villain somewhere. There has to be a like, there has to be a dislike. There has to be an aversion towards this other thing. Growing up in Lebanon in a war-torn country for 17 years, that's what I was fed. They're the bad guys. We're the good guys. They're doing this to us, so we have to do this to them. And then you look at the global scene, and that's what you see. And it, the flavors always change. It could be this, the war on drugs, the war on this, the war on, I don't know, tomorrow might be war on aliens. I don't know. There was always a war against something. But what is that keeping us in the mechanism of 
the mechanism of love and hate, love and hate, love and hate, love and hate. It keeps us stuck on the hamster wheel of the fire that is burning. Similarly, the tongue is burning, Lord Buddha says. Flavors are burning. Tasting is burning. Tongue contact is burning. And whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of tongue contact, be it pleasant, painful, neutral, that also is burning. Burning with what? Burning with fires of passion, fires of hatred, and with the fires of delusion. And so forth, he goes in. And um, oftentimes, when we talk about pleasure, depending on the person's past in meditation experience and how well they have been meditating, let's say, or gone deep enough, depending on that level, they might look at pleasure in a certain way. Many might actually look at this discourse and say, well, this is like, I, I don't think I like this sutta because it teaches me to kind of cut my connection with life because they see pleasure as the way to experience life. If I'm alive, then I'm supposed to experience pleasure. And that is a problem. That is having delusion as far as the Dhamma is concerned. Most people find that by seeking pleasures, they will attain happiness. Every single warlord, every single uh, entity who has created wars and, and creates destruction in the world, unhappiness, suffering for others, functions pretty much the same way though. They think that by going and taking your rights and this and that, and taking away the environment and taking away the resources and becoming that 0.01% that controls, then they will automatically be happy. No, Lord Buddha says, that has nothing to do with happiness. You're functioning basically on the premise of these fires, meaning the delusions, the basis of the fire. You're lusting after pleasure. You're hating something that you cannot control. And you're completely oblivious and deluded about the suffering of others. Meanwhile, you have tremendous assets and opportunities for comfort, for pleasures. There's no limits to how much you can obtain given your resources. But that's not happiness. But most of us follow the same premise, though, with the same agenda, if you will. We're not looking at happiness being something totally different. And that's what Lord Buddha was saying. Life is not a maximization of uh, pleasure and minimization of suffering. So you can get, you know, a good return on your life. Basically, at the end of your life, you'll go and say, well, I was able to extract this much joy, this much resources. And then what's going to happen? I'm going to croak and die. What, what, what is that going to do? I'm going to end up being a peta, a hungry ghost. Or in the animal realms, or even worse, in the hell realms. So this is something that Meditation allows us to see, and the Dhamma allows us to see that there is a difference being captive to the six senses because of the lust versus using the six senses as a source of happiness, not being attached to the outcomes and to the, to the adding of the features and the details that we like to do. When we see something, we don't see the thing. We actually see what we want to see. We add nuances to it constantly. So basically, we are becoming our own magicians. A few weeks ago, we were talking about the magician who saw a pile of bones of, of a tiger. And because he had the ability to, let's say, it's, it's you know, a story. 
you know, to put a spell on the and then make some you know chants and things and all of a sudden the tiger comes alive but the tiger is hungry pounces on the guy and eats him Oof. that's what we're doing when we see things when we hear things we're adding our own spells onto what it is that we're hearing we're seeing we're tasting we're touching we're thinking that's why most of us are captives, slaves to our thoughts, perceptions of reality, how we want to think, see things. And several months ago, we covered the Bahya Sutta. Lord Buddha said what to him? He said, when seeing Bahya, just see. When sensing something, just sense it. Don't add your two cents worth to it. Just see it. But that is a special art form, special ability that comes only through the process of meditation plus applying wisdom to it. So sati and sampajanya have to go hand in hand. Similarly, the body is burning, touches are burning, touching is burning. Body contact is burning and whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of body contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also is burning. So we basically lock on the features and the details of the thing. You have countless places in the suttas where Lord Buddha says, the meditator when seeing an object does not get pulled into its signs and its features. Because if you do that, you are caught in the tornado, in the whirlwind. It will pull you in. And suddenly what looked like rather neutral suddenly has this special gravitational force to pull you in, a black hole that will tear up a star, molecule by molecule, atom by atom. That's what will happen to the person. Now the person is walking away from that interaction but the interaction is following him, with him, meaning he's constantly pondering about this, worried about this. What is the source of depression in most cases? The same thing. Well, that's what happened 16 years ago in seven months and 14 days ago. That's what happens when someone slapped me or hurt my feelings, when my mother looked at me in a, in a not so caring of a manner. When was that? Life was happening since then. And we have been keeping that fire going, fanning it constantly. And so long as we have sanya, so long as we have memory, and so long as the wrong attention is placed on that memory, ayoni somana sikara guess what? It will continue damaging us. These things have to happen because of contact. But what does contact rely on? Contact relies on attention. Again, there's healthy attention or radical attentiveness or the wrong kind of attention, misplaced attention. Like I think last week I was mentioning how it's like you're driving a, a 16 wheel truck, a massive truck while you're looking elsewhere and you're in traffic and you're going full speed. That is ayoni somanasikara, but that is how we're leading, leading, leading our lives. So contact needs to have attention, but what does attention need? Attention needs chanda. Several weeks ago, we talked about, we covered the Idipada Vibhanga Sutta, uh, where uh, Venerable Mahamogalana was talking about the four psychic or spiritual powers, powers of success. And the first of which is chanda. Chanda is that spark. You know, fire has to start with a spark, a match, a trigger. That is what will dictate the direction of the attention. And remember, when there is chanda, there is manasikara or yoniso manasikara. And when there is correct attention, the mind will not go in the 
into the wrong pasta or contact. The contact we have will not be that of lust, hatred, or delusion. Because when there is correct or radical type of wholesome attention, there's no way you're going to be sucked into the signs and features of the object that you're looking at, the thing that you're observing. So otherwise, everything is going to be burning. That's why arahants are not burning. They're not trying to prove anyone that they're arahants. <laughs> That's another thing. They're comfortable with themselves. They couldn't care less. They're just living, doing their thing. They're living in Nibbana. There's no bur more burning going on. And what a wonderful state to be in, <laughs> apparently. But burning with what? They're all burning with the fires of passion, with the fires of hatred. And this goes on. Uh, also, aha, uh -huh, this is the good one. Uh, the mind is burning. Concepts are burning. Thinking is burning. Mind contact is burning and whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of mind contact, be it pleasant, painful or neutral, that also is burning. A burning with, with what? They're burning with the fires of passion, with hatred, delusion. In life, we develop an extensive laboratory or not a laboratory, but a library of experiences, of memories, of data of of narratives of narratives of stories if this happens then that that's what's going to take place so we have our own stories that we have attached to things but these stories are the things that keep us in a loop and because of the time factor because of us constantly playing these looped uh recycled stories of things most of the time, these memories have nothing to do with what really occurred. They're based on fantasy. They're based on, on, on fiction. But we are ready to give our lives for them because we like these concepts, we love these pre perceptions. And that is one of the great things to every once in a while, not every day, but every once in a while to communicate with your kalyanamittas, with your spiritual friends, to basically exchange thoughts and impressions and, and, and see if you are still on the track or con uh, contact or be in connection with your teacher. It's always good. Or at least even if you don't have a teacher to access the suttas, to see the greatest of all teachers there. See if what you are experiencing, what you are thinking is going in line with what is being taught there. Because so often we fall into the trap of believing everything we think, which is the most seductive of all senses. I mean, so many people want to be on blogs, and, and I know some bhikkhus who always are on blogs, answering this question, getting into this argument, this and that, all in the name of Dhamma. Well, good luck, because one thing's for sure, you keep on fanning that flame. Yes, it's not lust, it's not, you're not looking at a cover of a, I don't know, porno magazine, but it can be just as seductive, if not even more to be going and pushing for your own ideas, to be correct, to squeeze it down people's throats. Who cares? But that gives us sustenance. Gives what sustenance? To the feelings. Why? Because it's contact. Why? Because the attention is in the wrong place. Plain and simple. If you want to attain Nibbana, there has to be, at the very least, yoni somanasikara, plain and simple, correct, wise reflection has to be there. The attention has to be correct. It has to be placed in the correct place. 
If I'm going to fly to Denmark and I'm taking the flight to Zimbabwe, I will not reach Denmark if that is my final destination. I have to go to the right terminal, to the right gate. I have to have the right ticket. Even though my intention is correct, supposedly. But the attention is the most important thing. The attention has the unique position or authority, if you will, to even turn on the inten intention itself. It can turn even its head like a snake back on Chetana to observe what is this volition whose trajectory I'm just following blindly, but hold on a second. Is this correct? Let me check. That let me check is Yoni Somanasikara, which we must have in our bag of tricks, if you will, as meditators, because we can easily be swayed, easily be swayed. Even with good intentions, supposedly, but the attention has to be correct because the attention has to be given the right, the carte blanche to go ahead and even investigate. That's why we also covered the Viman Saka Sutta some months ago, the investigation of one's own teacher, including the greatest of all teachers, Lord Buddha himself. He is exposing himself to scrutiny, investigation by the student. If he did that, then we must do that towards ourselves. So, <clears throat> but bhikkhus, Lord Buddha adds, by understanding this as it truly is, the noble disciple in training is pulled away as he becomes disenchanted with the eye, disenchanted with forms, disenchanted with vision, disenchanted with eye contact. And whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of eye contact, excuse me, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also makes him disenchanted. It loses its, its appeal on you. Just like Disney lost its appeal on me when I grew up. Although I know some adults who go crazy over Disney, anything to do with Disney, so no comments there. But we... You know, I think even uh, Jesus has something like that in the gospel where he says, when I was a child, I used to play with childlike things, with the childish things, the toys. But when I became an adult, he says, I stopped. I grew up. So as we're practicing, there must be this enchantment taking place at one point or another. Some meditators don't like the word disenchantment. They still want to be grabbed by the six senses, by the fires that keep burning. But I hope this sutta will allow us to kind of rethink that approach. Because it's like otherwise standing on, on two boats, one foot on one boat and the other foot on the other, and each boat is going in a different direction. So we need to make a commitment as to which boat we want to be on to cross the flood to cross the flood. So, um, so it's not about telling ourselves a story and seeing a visible object, but just to see the object and not be pulled into it, seeing it for what it is and seeing what it generates in us. That's the key. When I'm seeing an object, let's say uh, uh, delicious food and I'm hungry, Okay, did the delicious food or the food itself that I'm presuming to be delicious uh, stop and I brought my attention on the feeling? So basically that triggered something and it's no longer relevant because now I'm pulled into this hurricane, this tornado taking place inside of me, which is the feeling. This is when we have been sucked into the story and the details in the what ifs. Oh, when I eat this, I'm going to feel this. Oh, it's going to have this. It's going to have, I'm no longer seeing it. I'm no longer tasting it. 
I've gone off the reservation in, in a sense. So uh, there is a sense of maturity then involved with every single interaction we have, every single sense awareness. That's why Lord Buddha always insisted on the mind standing guard at the doors of each of uh, these doors, the sense doors. Because all it takes is a moment of mindlessness, heedlessness, instead of heedfulness, diligence that the whole thing comes crashing down. And all of a sudden we are caught in sadness or uh, incredible jubilation, exhilaration, excitement, but because passion or, or pleasure and pain go hand in hand, they're the two sides of the same coin. Suddenly there will be because of impermanence, there's not gonna be any more of that intense pleasure. Well, guess what? That's going to create a vacuum the absence of pleasure is pain. Guess what? Now we are back in feeling depressed, anguished, anxiety. And now the heart is longing for more of that. What was it? So it's looking for its next kick, like next addiction, next drug. So we, in our culture, if the six sense doors are going unchecked, with proper attention, wise reflection, yoni sumanasikara, then we are essentially all drugged, being, you know, drugging ourselves. And we're, we keep on being the addicts of life. So, um, but this doesn't go, uh, you know, in many ways, this doesn't go along with what, as I was saying earlier, with, with what life is presenting to us. No, go and see this, go and taste this, go seek happiness. How many car commercials have we seen where it says, find love again? What? It's a car. Find love again? You know, find youth again. You see this especially with uh, men who go through, let's say, Middle age crisis, right? Uh, you see this a lot. You, they go and buy a red convertible, usually red. Um, you know, a whole bunch of things follows because they want to reestablish to themselves, reconfirm that no, I am still the guy that I was. I'm still this. And women have their own things to deal with. And that's why we have a trillion dollar, you know, cosmetics industry. Um, all of these are all because we are burning. Aditta. So, but we can't live in society comfortably, happily, without being pulled in. You can still go ahead and enjoy your food. You can still go ahead and, and, and see Eiffel Tower if you want. Experience all those things, but without dwelling on the feeling of it, which is the trap. That is the mouse trap. That is the trap. Because now you're going to want more of that, irrespective of what you saw. When I first went to New York City uh, in the early 90s or mid 90s, uh, I had my brand new Canon camera that I just bought for the trip in those days. There was no digital cameras. So I kept on taking pictures left and right, left and right, left and right. And then I was like, well, wait a minute. I'm not even looking at the thing with my eyes. I'm just taking the pictures so that later on I can look at the photograph. I can put it in an album. I can show it, especially. That's a big thing, right? That's a big reward. I can show it to others that I was there. It's very subtle. It's there, you know, that desire. But as far as the eyes are concerned, they might have seen it, but it's like, yeah, you know, quickly in passing. That means that there's the fire that's burning. It's, it has nothing to do with the object. Ultimately, it is with, I'm fixated on the feeling, the tone of it that I'm going to extract from this experience. Irrespective of you, tasty meal, ah, you're not that important. 
but that's not living life. That's why when you look at an awakened person, they are looking at you. They're not absent. They're not absent and, and lost in greed, in lust, in what they can get from you. They're not lost in anger or in delusion. They are present, just like a baby, <laughs> if you will. They look at you, they're like, ah, it's open open, fully there. They're authentic. So this is also teaching us, Lord Buddha is teaching the 1000 bhikkhus to be authentic by seeing fire for what it truly is, not the outside fire, any idiot could see that. But see the other fire here, he says. So let us put the brakes on impulsive living, which is what we do impulsively, addicted fashion. We don't even know where we're going because the attention is not in the right, right place. So that is the life of a Putujana, by the way. Putujana is an ordinary, common person. You might be educated. You might even be a meditator for many, many, many years. You might even be in robes. You might be, still be a Putujana if you're functioning on these three just being lustful, aversive, and deluded, impulsively living, going after your instincts, basically, without applying wisdom. And this also pulls us out of the flight or uh, fight or flight or freeze tendencies, by the way, uh, when we are locating ourselves in the present moment, when we're bringing ourselves, seeing something that is frightful, scary, the immediate reaction is, let me run. You see this a lot with PTSD patients and, and, and individuals who have had trauma. And by the way, unfortunately, most of us, if you're living on this planet, we've all been traumatized during the past two years. Okay, let's be honest. Uh, some more than others. But there is this, which by the way, also when we're running away from something, it also means the presence of aversion viapada, ill will, towards something. I'm hating something. That's why I'm running away from this. I don't want this. Basically, there is the lack of authentic living, meaning the absence of mindfulness. That's why an awakened person is present. But how can you be present without sati? Presence and sati are synonymous. That's what I'm trying to say. Presence to the experience of the six sense doors. When your thought comes in and it's a lustful thought, let's say, that doesn't mean that it's you. It might just be your old algorithms playing in the background, but that's not you. Or an angry thought comes in, that still is not you. It's just a thought. It's a, it's a sankara, it's been playing around for eons, but that's not you. Something might have happened, something might have jolted and all of a sudden you have that thought. Now, what you do with that thought, that is the key. That is where Lord Buddha said, the most important action is the mental action. What I do with that thought is the key. You might have a wild thought come in, lustful thought, angry thought, okay. Why? Or a deluded thought, because we can also have, you know, uh, the the um, idle chatter pre uh, uh, precept happening in the mind most of the time. So we need to watch it. So I have to have a position towards that thought. Oh, you can drop it right then and there, and that is the mental action, not the thought itself, the memory itself, which is sanya. That's why Lord Buddha says uh, in the Magandiya Sutta, uh, Sanya Virattasa Nasanti Ganta. For a person who has seen perception for what it is, uh, there are no bonds. 
no shackles to be entangled by. Panya uh, vimuttasa nasanti moha. For the person who has been liberated uh, by wisdom, there are no delusions. So sanya is always powerful, the most powerful. Uh, if you call it mara, I don't think it would be saying something wrong. <laughs> That's how seductive sanyas are, the perceptions, the thoughts we have. And that they are the ones who are coming in, intruding upon the experience between the sense object and your sense, the eye. Because the eye is not at fault. The object itself is not at fault. It's what is happening in between. What I'm doing with it. What is my position towards that? Uh, some weeks ago, I think I said about chitta, the example of uh, the householder Anaga, I mean Chitta, who corrected the elder bhikkhus and said, it's not the white ox, it's not the black ox. The fact that they're bound together with the yoke, it's the yoke. And what is the yoke? It's craving, it's tanha. And that's what we're talking about. It's not the sense object, it's not the sense organ. So, uh, well, sometimes people ask like, well, how would I be placing myself in that moment? Let's say if I'm running away from, you know, if I'm in a fight or flight or freeze mode, what should I do to ground myself? To not be pulled into my negative thinking, what should I do? Well, of course you can, if, it's, if, it, if you're feeling angry, you can always drop into metta bhavana. For yourself, forgiveness at that moment for yourself towards the other person, if you can. But at the very least, connecting to the body. Sometimes if that's too much to ask, even anapanasati is too much, breath meditation, even if that is impossible, go ahead and use uh, uh, buddhanusati, uh, remembrance of the qualities of Lord Buddha. You can say buddho, 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 just for that to kind of ooh, laser yourself back into the present. Or arahang, arahang, arahang. These are the qualifiers of Lord Buddha that we pay homage to. So you can pull yourself out of that moment. And a serious meditator is one who applies breath meditation or especially metta meditation when dealing with such situations on a constant basis, it's not just one hour of sitting, basically. So let's go back. Similarly, because by understanding this as it truly is, the noble disciple in training is pulled away as he becomes disenchanted with the ear, disenchanted with sounds, disenchanted with hearing, disenchanted with the ear contact. And whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of ear contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also makes him disenchanted. You know, I might close my eyes when I see something ugly. We might do that. When you sit to meditate, even in the midst of, you know, a dirty place, a uh, loud place, well, not a loud place, no visually loud place, you can get away with protecting yourself. But what can we do when there is sound involved? You can put earplugs, you can buy expensive, you know, soundproof headphones, but they're not long-term. So hearing is one of the most invasive, um, um, uh, uncomfortable experiences we can have. Whether you have noisy neighbors, noisy street, um, but how can you become disenchanted? I was recently recording uh, one of the books by uh, a venerable, late venerable uh, Katakurunde Nyananda, a wonderful book. Um, and um, he talks about um, the, um, it's, it's, the book is called, uh, by the way, this one's called uh, From Topsy Turvydom to Wisdom, Volume One. Um, he says, you know, we never pay attention to the rhythm that's going on in the ears. 
and he says there's uh, we don't pay attention to the beat of the eardrum you know it's a drum so it has a beat so he had very a poetic uh, a poetic way of describing such difficult to con understand concepts principles of the dhamma and he says this beautifully he says this the rhythm of the eardrum is this calm that's one it has he says it has three rhythms by the way the first one he says is calm the second rhythm is stay and the third one is go away do you see the lusting the aversion and just the delusion so when we hear in such a way, I mean, that was his method, you know, we, we can find our own, as long as we're using Yoniso Manasikara, is paying attention to this come, stay, or go away attitude. And it's not just with the ears, of course, you know, it's with the other senses as well, whether it's a skin or taste even. Similarly, bhikkhus, by understanding this as it truly is, the noble disciple in training is pulled away as he becomes disenchanted with the nose, disenchanted with odors, disenchanted with smelling, disenchanted with nose contact, and whatever kind of feeling that may occur because of nose contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also makes him disenchanted. Everything you touch nowadays has also some fragrance added to it. Shampoos for example, have so much fragrance added to them. Um, I was telling this, uh, I was reminded of this. Um, uh, when I was a kid, I, I, I told this incident to a student once. Um, when my, uh, you know, school would start, my mom would buy us, you know, stationery. And uh, in the 70s and early 80s, they were coming up with these erasers. Uh, to erase pencil markings, but they were so pretty, but they had also added uh, some type of fragrance to them, right? I'm seeing nodding, yes. So what I used to do was, <laughs> as a child, it would be so intoxicating. The smell, my brain would see it as, oh, if it smells so good, then it has to also taste good. So I would bite into these erasers and swallow them, hoping that I'm going to get a taste. And my mom eventually stopped buying me because we weren't, you know, ex you know, we weren't wealthy, we were poor, but, you know, eventually it's like, okay, what am I doing? So I would go to school with half chewed off erasers. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, shampoos, why do shampoos have to smell so seductive? Or things like, you know, it, it pulls the mind, especially if you're being, you know, if you're a meditator, you start noticing what these smells are doing, just like the sights. You become cognizant of them. You're not so easily pulled in. If the same goes with pheromones, um, the, the, the cologne or perfume that they put, they have to put special types, amounts of pheromones that are attractive just like the male deer tr does with its musk, you know, to try to grab hold, you know, call the, the females. That's what we're doing. Well, what is that? That's burning. Burning with desire. And all of a sudden we find ourselves, oh, writing a poetry to this person that we saw, or we had a coffee with, it's like, oh, you remind me of this. And all of, basically you want one thing. You're lusting after this person, plain and simple. And the same goes with the, you know, smelling of, uh, you know, you pass by a coffee shop and you're smelling the coffee smell if you're a coffee drinker. And you go into the coffee shop, if they allow you nowadays, you go in and, and um, all of a sudden you're like, it's no longer a matter of the, uh, the smell, the nose. Now we're talking about taste buds because you have spotted that cookie, that chocolate, muffin or brownie all of a sudden you're now we're dealing with this other door now what happened it's burning they're tossing we're being tossed around in the hands like a hot potato from one sense organ to the next 
Similarly, because by understanding this as it truly is the noble disciple in training is pulled away as he becomes disenchanted with the tongue, disenchanted with flavors, disenchanted with tasting, disenchanted with tongue contact. And whatever kind of feelings that may occur because of tongue contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also makes him disenchanted. Um, Similarly, because by understanding this, as it truly is, the noble disciple in training is pulled away as he becomes disenchanted with the body, disenchanted with, the, with touches, disenchanted with touching. Lord Buddha calls the sense of touch the most enticing and most seductive. And um, he usually uses the reference for a male to a female, from a female's point of view to a, to a male um how um, the touch he uses uh, is so seductive that's why as bhikkhus for example we have so many rules to limit such a possibility for example um and uh well because the skin is the biggest organ in the body it is an organ it it, it, it does so many functions but it also carries information of what is pleasurable, what is not so pleasurable or painful, and what is neutral for us. It covers the whole physical body. We're always looking for that. We're always looking for that. And it keeps the fire going. So, um, of course, this is not only a bad thing, obviously. It's not like looking at the fire in a bad way, per se. Let's say in the case of a child, an, an infant, to be exact, who is just born, that to, to, to balance the central nervous system, the, 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 um, to soothe the amygdala, to help the child to self-regulate, as we call it, to, br to bring about the sense of ease and comfort into the mind, of the infant, the infant has to be touching a warm, accepting surface, meaning of the touching of a caretaker, whether it's the mother or somebody else. We need that type of acknowledgement, especially in the, in the beginning part of our lives. So that cannot be undermined. Uh, so it does have its benefits, OK? Uh, by seeing something, for example, even though Lord Buddha is clearly saying what it is that it's burning, but by seeing something, you'll know that there's that truck coming at you because the driver is actually looking the other way because he has Ioni Somanasikara, remember? He's driving like this. So I have to use my eyes to jump out of the way. If I hear a screeching sound in my direction, somebody breaking, I'm, I need to be extra, extra cognizant of that and jump out of the way. Maybe there's a bike or a car headed my way and the brakes are not holding. If you taste something in the wild and you're hungry and you, you, you look at a fruit and you don't recognize it, what looks like a fruit, but it, you don't recognize it, but you, you're so hungry and you want to taste it, but it's immediately bitter. You don't taste it any further. You toss it out. You spit it out because it's poison. So the senses are there, not as our enemies. Again, the sense organ and the sense object. Our problem, our qualm is not with them. It is what we do with them, how we approach it. Similarly, because by understanding this as it truly is, the noble disciple in training is pulled away as he becomes disenchanted with the mind, disenchanted with concepts, disenchanted with thinking, disenchanted with mind contact, thought appearing. That's not you. It's just a thought. You don't have to hold it. You don't have to hold its hand. You don't have to say, oh, you and I are the same. No, no, no. It's just a thought. And the more we realize that we pull ourselves out of that identification mode and see it for what it is. I don't have to act upon you. Okay, you're there, you're a memory. Okay, I see you, I'm gonna walk away. 
and you allow that to wither and die at that moment. You don't carry it with you. And whatever kind of feelings that may occur, excuse me, because of mind contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neutral, that also makes him disenchanted. The most pervasive and influential, the most dominant, if you will, the one that has the most say, authority in all the six senses is the mind. Because you might stop seeing the thing after you turned away from looking at the visual object. The neighbor's dog might have stopped barking half an hour ago, but it's still barking in my mind. I'm still seeing that ugly image, the uh, uh, assault to my senses. I'm still seeing it, feeling it in my mind. Where? The mind is replaying, rewinding the tape. It's on a loop. It's on a loop. Sometimes news agencies, especially the mass media, when they want to shock and keep you captive to trauma, what they'll do is they will replay a traumatic event that happened. And that's one of the surest ways, uh, guaranteed ways that you can traumatize a person by playing it again, the tape. In the in Cold uh, War era, or even in Vietnam or Afghanistan and other places, um, people who would grab the opponent's soldiers, let's say POWs, prisoners of, prisoners of war, they would expose them to severe torture. Uh, but one of them was the psychological torture. They would replay certain things that are extremely um, either visual or sound based. Put headphones on, they can't remove them to re-traumatize the POW, the person, the prisoner. And that is what we are being exposed to on a consistent basis on this planet. Um, both externally by, let's say, whoever the powers that be, media, this, that, but I'm more interested in what we are doing and what we're doing is a lot more pervasive and influential because we, we know all the buttons what buttons to push and um, to really bring us down, to really torture ourselves. And Lord Buddha was saying, enough, enough bhikkhus. You have left that world of fire worship. You are here now. And you need to look at the real fire that's been burning in your hearts all this time, but you were completely oblivious to it. And by not looking at these photoshopped mental impressions, because that's what the mind does, it photoshops constantly, it, it doctors, it manicures, it's, I don't know, pedicures, whatever you want to call it, the impressions that it picks up, it is no longer having anything to do with the reality that took place. That's why the mind is the most powerful. Let's not forget the, the, the first verse of the Dhammapada. The mind is the forerunner of all states, evil and good. So I have the authority to apply my attention upon the mind itself to see what is playing on its screen. And that is where we start to really uh, look at this battle that's going on with anicca dukkha anatta because the mind doesn't like these okay the mind the patujana's mind does not like anicca dukkha anatta impermanence suffering and non-substantiality because to see these three the three characteristics of existence that lord buddha discovered saw really, truly, means that you're no longer going to persuade yourself to be fooled by you, by the senses. You're just going to see what is there. That's it. 
You're just going to, even the mind, especially the mind, seeing whatever memories pop up, thoughts. Okay. Okay, I see you. Move on, move on, move on. And then when anicca, a concept like anicca, the principle of anicca appears because you have encountered something in real life, maybe yourself, maybe you saw wrinkles, maybe your hair is falling or it's turning gray, you see it, and immediately your mind plays that memory of you from an older version where you didn't have these issues. Ah, what is happening here? All of a sudden, that's when anicca, dukkha, anatta can really be brought out into the forefront. And we can see with those eyes now. And that is seeing with wisdom. That is basically the essence of uh, insight meditation. Because you're looking without arrogance to what is happening. You're looking without ignorance. Ignorance, avijja, is not necessarily, necessarily the lack of uh, uh, of wisdom, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, of intelligence or knowledge. It's not that. It is the presence. Vidya is the presence. Avidya is the absence of a mind that is there fully to see what is really going on. You're not basically convincing, trying to convince yourself of something that is not there. And most of us are doing that because we keep on adding new brush strokes of different colorations, just like those manufacturers had done with the, spraying this eraser with the fragrance that this child could go and chew and maybe even choke on. I don't know. I didn't choke on it. Anyhow. So, uh, we're no longer being tightly glued to, to what is being tossed at us. And um, because of the presence of constant mindfulness and without adding more and more details and, and features onto it. And Lord Buddha adds, uh, the sutta goes that is, being thus pulled away and disenchanted from all these, he becomes dispassionate. And as a result of his dispassion, his mind is freed and his heart released. Being thus released, there arises within him direct knowledge and understanding. As he knows for the first time, it is now finally liberated. And with this experience, he fully comprehends. Now, birth is finally destroyed. The holy life has been fully lived. What had to be done is now done and finished. There is no further coming to any state of re-becoming. This is what the Blessed One said. And in hearing these words of the Blessed One, those 1,000 bhikkhus rejoiced in their hearts. For while this discourse was being explained by the Tathagata, the hearts of all 1,000 bhikkhus through no longer grasping onto anything, suddenly were released from the contaminants completely. And they became 1,000 more arahants. Sad, sad, sad. Once we know the correct method, we need to apply it. Otherwise, the fires will not extinguish themselves. And uh, because not only our present life is riding on this, but dependent on this, but also our future. We need to take heed and we need to really put a lot of consideration as to what is to come for us. Forget about the world around you, but just you. At this point, it's important for you to be uh, focusing on yourself and uh, where your thoughts are taking you. Where your thoughts are, how, what state are you in constantly? Is it full of, is your heart full of anger, frustration, anxiety? Well, the next moment is going to come out of this moment. If I'm experiencing anxiety all the time, guess what? 
I'm going to walk into the next moment with the anxiety, into the next life with the same anxiety. If I'm depressed, I'm going to go to the equivalent environment of that depression. And why am I depressed? So that's where I'm encouraging you to, to look at. So we can come out of this fear, anxiety, excitement, shame, and worry jumble of things that we are constantly caught up in. That's dealing with the sankharas properly. When you just see, okay, there is some shame in me. Okay, there's some worry in me. Okay. Let me work with that. Instead of the object, it could be the world, it could be your partner, it could be your dog, your cat, your neighbor, whatever. But ultimately, what is happening in your heart is your responsibility. And that is because that means that we are with the khandas more so than we are with the dhamma. The khandas will not turn around and become the dhamma. They can become the tools that can, can uh, help us to understand the Dhamma. But the Dhamma is the Dhamma and the Khandas are the, are the Khandas, as uh, Ajahn Man would say. So in order for us to distinguish, uh, not distinguish, but extinguish the fires within us, we need to own up to this living experience. That is our life however long we have of it. And by putting on a smile, genuine smile, and, and, and taking one moment at a time. I will pause here um, and, and uh, see if there are any thoughts, questions, comments, critiques um, that you can share. I hope you could yeah. all hear me all this time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Go ahead. Thank you for this really great talk. <laughs> Sorry, I have a weird virtual background. Um, okay. Because I could not go to campus for a long time. So <laughs> a way to look at the UCLA campus. Mm. It occurs to me that it is much easier for someone who is living alone to kind of um, abstain for, from these uh, senses that are constantly bombarding us. So when you said that um, whether we admit it or not, we are all traumatized the last two years, I feel kind of guilty because I actually enjoy very much the last two years because um, I do not look at figures. I know it seems very cruel. You don't look at the mortality rate and all that. And I feel that there's nothing I can do. You know, if the pandemic is going, the only thing I can do is to stay home, is to not infect other people or not get infected, but I cannot control people who want to visit me because they think I might be lonely, but actually I never felt lonely. So, um, but it's just so good to not to have to drive and to breathe fresher air because you feel that there are so many less uh, crowded on the streets so you can take a walk and you, know, you have to wear a mask and uh, sometimes I cheat because I, I just walk to places where there are no people. And then I want to relate that to what you said about perfume. I think perfume is like people put on perfume to attract other people. But for me, I never find perfume attractive. And so if I were to buy detergent, I would rather pay more to find any detergent that has no, especially for clothing, because I tend to be allergic to anything with perfume. And similarly, when I get on the elevator, I always get turned off by whether it's men or women putting on huge amount of perfume. So I think even our so-called senses are not like natural. I don't think it, there's a, a, such a natural thing, but it's like being commercialized. You know, we are seen as, oh, this is a great smell. So I, I tell all, 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 all the people who give me perfume that I would only use it to as insect repellent. So, so don't buy me any perfume. So I just really appreciate your talk that is like, maybe there's nothing wrong with me <laughs> that I don't want to be bombarded with these. I, I would never choose an eraser. That's not my problem. <laughs> yeah. 
But then other people look at me and say that, oh, I'm eating so unhealthily because I'm just simple oatmeal and all that. I'm not putting, they just feel that, oh, you know, you should change your habit and, and everyone, they just feel that, oh, you should try this because it was, you know, rated as so, so high on the list as being nutritious or delicious. And I, I was never tempted by that kind of. Um, well, it, it sounds like you are ready to sit longer. <laughs> for your meditation and what i mean by that is uh you're on the right track as 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 far as what i'm understanding uh um the meditation can go deeper if you are looking at life and all these phenomena that i shared with you uh with you know with the sense of this disenchantment or detachment and that is crucial. Um, yes, uh, this is uh, an environment that you would find somewhat uh, artificially created in, uh, in a monastery, in a monastic environment or on retreats. However, it's, it depends on the person always, of course. A person can become uh, uh, depressed, uh, anxious, uh, as, as a psychotherapist, I know the, the numbers of, of uh, depression, uh, depressive cases has skyrocketed during the last two years of patients wanting to be seen by therapists. Um, so because of the, the imposition, whatever has, you know, people have been put into in a sense, but it depends ultimately on how the person sees it, views it. Uh, of course, you don't have the same freedoms as you did, whether you're living alone or not. Like you said, going outside, there are certain restrictions. You can't put, you know, you can't walk and breathe the actual delicious fresh air that we have now, and and not what they were saying all this time. You know, there's there's less CO2 in the air, plain and simple, and it cleared up actually after a few months uh, last year uh, or the year prior. I forgot, you know, I can't keep tabs on what's which lockdown we're doing. Um, but basically, um, it is up to the person, of course, to view it and uh, to approach it. Uh, and if you're getting all your sustenance through oatmeal and you're getting your nutrients, perfect. My concern has always been how is the quality of the mind while you're doing that? Is there comparison going on? Is there conceit going on? Um, because that also uh, plays in the background. It's very silent. It's very subtle, usually. Uh, I am better, I am less than, I am equal to. Those three aspects of conceit can play, or you might overcome them. So there's all these wonderful opportunities for growth taking place, despite all the trauma that is still taking place. Um, and e people apply different techniques to bring a sense of homeostasis into their lives, how things used to be, to feel normal, basically. Uh, you will add a little bit of this, a little bit of that, take some of this to kind of get that sense of homeostasis into your life again. And that might not still be, uh, you know, uh, that might still be traumatic for the person because they don't want to deal with what is really happening. So we each approach difficult, traumatic experiences in different ways, but for some of us, that can also be a gateway to healthier living, understanding yourself and gaining the beauty of the beautiful outcome rather, or outcomes of living uh, uh, secluded, not always, uh, because even as bhikkhus, we have to get out. Uh, where I live, I get outside maybe once a month, maybe one and a half months, every six weeks, I get outside. I'm, I'm mostly at my residence where I'm at and meditating and, and doing my practice and, and, and doing my writing and, and translations and all that recordings. There's no need whether the world is in this place, in this situation or not, I'm okay. 
So how the person is approaching it is crucial. So, yes. Any other thoughts, uh, questions, comments? Yes. Bonte, thank you for your talk. I'm, I'm wondering if you can clarify for me, and this is the short part of the question, clarify for me where attention comes in the cycle. So the longer question is my understanding of dependent origination is that it's a continuing cycle going on and on and on very quickly. And so with the canvas, when we're talking about contact, feeling, perceptions, et cetera, that's also a cycle that's going on continually. And in my written notes that I had, what I've got written is that attention comes at the beginning. We only come into contact with the things that we have our attention on. There can be other many things always going on all the time, bombarding our senses, but we only notice the ones that we have our attention on. And I think I heard you to say, and, and this is where you can correct me, is that you said after Sanya, after the when the memory comes in, you then went on to, uh, I can't find my notes now, but uh, attention comes from the memory. Uh. So memory is in a different, Sanya is in a different section, uh. is a different order in my list than where I had attention. So I just wondering if you can clarify for me where attention is in, the, in this ongoing cycle. I love the way you're so candid with how your mind functions and how, how you share so generously with us and which you know, you, you're know you able to verbalize it to us, a function that many of us are going through probably. But this, um, I will approach your question or questions in this way. There's always a stumbling block. There's always a temptation to go into dogma, into do the dogmatic interpretation of things. What do I mean by that? Into looking at it as airtight compartments, the principles, including uh, the khandas, the five aggregates, or especially um, I, I love it when people get into debates over, over Paticca Samupada, dependent arising, the 12 links. And, and we like to nitpick, and, uh, and which is basically a simple uh, reflection of what is going on already in the mind of the person in trying to analyze, understand, and, 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 and formulate some concepts uh, to create some relatability with these very ephemeral, very non-tangible almost things, if not non-tangible, period. Aspects of reality that Lord Buddha formulated within Paticca Samuppada. Why dogmatic? The moment we actually look at them as crystallized, boxed in principles with clear dimensions, then we run the risk of functioning from avidya, functioning from ignorance, functioning from even conceit. And I see this a lot. Everybody nowadays has their own interpretation of what Paticca Samuppada is, sadly. And unfortunately, they are talking Adhamma. And my source for claiming such a statement, making such a statement, is the suttas. It has to agree with the teachings of Lord Buddha. Whatever somebody's saying, plain and simple, you have the suttas and you have the vinaya. Those two are the sources. Okay. How does that relate with the attention bit that you mentioned? And Sanya, for example. Yes, we have the overarching principle of existence in the form of its facets and how it functions in its cycles, meaning the Paticca Samuppada principles, right? So you have ignorance, you have the Sankaras, etc., all the way to Bhava and then you know, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and all that. It can be easily misconstrued, misunderstood, as the case was with many, many commentators. To this day, starting with back then with Buddha Gosha, where he even divided the Paticca Samuppada to make sense for him into three lifetimes. 
they're not happening in three lifetimes. They're very much 100% related with you, your living experience now in this moment. Okay, let's put Paticca Samapada there nicely for the moment. So they're not workable tools in a sense on an immediate level uh, as, far, as far as being able to take a tool and apply it in dealing with this situation. For those, Lord Buddha had different formulaic structures that he presented. So what I'm saying is we have to use different tool sets. And fortunately, the Dhamma never runs out of tool sets, toolboxes. So you have the five faculties. You have the seven factors of awakening, all of which play a role, a huge role in the grand scheme of things, meaning Paticca Samuppada. They are workable though. You can identify and you can extend, you can see, you can even have a, a, a relationship with, unlike the passing of the linkages of the dependent origination. But I'm not gonna talk about the seven factors of awakening or the five faculties. I'm going to come back to the crucial part of your question, which was about attention. Where does this fall in? How does this come in? Where is it from specifically? And it comes from the very first aspect of the khandas, meaning nama rupa, nama rupa. Rupa, if you remember, is the four primaries, what we loosely term as the four great elements. And they're not just earth, water, air, uh, and uh, fire, but the qualities that they represent, meaning a solidity, fluidity, uh, heat, and, and, and uh, the movement, moving. So you have that. And in, in addition to that, you have the form, the physical attribute, the appearance of the thing. So the five khandas are the things that make up a person, all right? The five aggregates. And they all lean upon each other like three, uh, like five pieces of stick leaning against each other. You remove one, everything falls apart. That's what khanda means. So, excuse me. So you have the rupa part of the first khanda, right? And, and for all those of you who might have a hard time following the khandas, basically there are five, as I mentioned, nama rupa, Vedana, Nama Rupa is name and form or uh, materiality and mentality or mentality and materiality. Uh, you have Vedana, which is feeling. You have Sanya, which are the memories, perceptions, mental associations. You have the Sankharas, which are the things that we carry with us into our lives from life to life and limitless eons of lives, beginningless. Uh, tendencies, think of them as habitual tendencies, uh, patterns that we fall into. And then you have the vijnana, which is the sense awareness. So what I'm going after is the first one, nama rupa. Okay, so I just mentioned the rupa portion of the nama rupa, right? The four elements and uh, their at, uh, attributes, if you will. Attention happens to fall in the nama group. Okay, so what that means is within Nama, we have, again, um, um, well, first we have, um, we have attention, we have intention, we have perception, we have uh, feeling, and we have contact, these five. Now, the mind likes to say, okay, contact, okay, where do I see contact? Oh, it's in the Paticca Samuppada, it's in the dependent origination. So it's the same thing. We're talking about the same thing, right? Yes and no. No in the sense that it is not workable to use the Paticca Samuppada contact principle. Here I can, when I say workable, I mean in this moment of experiencing life, I can see clearly if I'm doing engaged in an action, I can look and see clearly what the inten intention is, what the attention is. I can see what perceptions I started with, what notions, what memories, what thoughts. 
I can see what feelings this is generating thanks to the contact. These now become more palatable, more chewable, more relatable, more tangible for the mind to process. So if I'm making an unwholesome action happen, if I'm, a, I'm the author of an of a unwholesome behavior, I can see where the attention is if I bring in sati. I can see what the attention, what uh, predominance, what has the most predominance, that's what I'm trying to say, of these in me conducting this act. Well, obviously there is wrong view somewhere because I am conducting this. Well, why is there wrong view? Why? Well, because I am leaning more into mm, a memory like I want to go back to the Eiffel Tower. Well, why? I'm going to toil over this and that and this, you know, I'm going to suffer and do work overtime and go through the hassle of flying this and that to go there. And I'm not, I'm, I'm actually going to be bitter about the whole experience. But it required all five for me to execute those. Specifically, attention. Specifically, attention. Now, without causing too much of a uh, confusion in some minds in hearing this, because it's it's very it can be very technical, of course, as you can see. But an easier way of approaching attention is this. Chanda, which we've covered several weeks ago, uh, is the enthusiasm, is the fervency, the desire, the, 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 the curiosity, the hunger for something, in a sense. But the desire, the, the enthusiasm. Think of it as the root, the root, which sustains the tree. Now, as you go up the tree, that chanda, that enthusiasm, that fervency becomes more magnified, more tangible. And that is when attention is coming into view. So the more magnified version of your enthusiasm is attention. But it doesn't stop there. It needs to form, it needs to get to the next phase of it, which is the contact, which is what I was referring to constantly today in reference to the burning. All things are burning. Ultimately, attention is only important as far as I'm concerned vis-a-vis -vis the contact that it gets us to. What kind of a contact is this attention taking me to? And that contact is the passa which materializes the attention. It gives it three dimensionality. The contact is. So if you want to bring back the Paticca Samuppada principles here and view it in that fashion, by all means. But please don't go trying to look for the attention as a principle within the structure of the 12 links of causal relations. Because even the 12 links, we call it 12 links, but in some places it's not even 12. Because Lord Buddha had, you know, he was very fluid with these. But we, 26 centuries later, we like to have solidity. We like to have reliability. We have to have this, you know, airtight, watertight compartments of principles. And that's why we, I call them dogma. We turn it into dogma when it's not, when they're not. They're there as a tool, as tools for us to see the Dhamma, to make sense this, of this thing called life, to make sense of why did I just do that? We can't attribute it to something like out there, mystical, esoteric, metaphysical, or even blame it on karma. No, we don't have that luxury. We have to look at the functions, the mechanism. What was the formula that brought me to this point? There, gotta, there has to be some steps that I follow. Yes, and that is the Nama Rupa structure. So without understanding Nama Rupa, it's really impossible to understand Paticca Samuppada. 
any of the links of the Patichasampada. In fact, some might even say, without understanding Nama Rupa, you can understand any of the other Khandas. In fact, if you understand Nama Rupa, you understand consciousness. In fact, when you look at the Paticca Samuppada structure as Lord Buddha does the Anuloma and Patiloma going forward and back as to because of this, this happens, because of not this, this does not happen. The, when you get to the Vinyana portion, interesting. Nama Rupa is there on both ends. This caught my attention years ago. I was like, wait a minute. Whoa, this is, this is serious. This is, what is this? Not enough attention is given to Nama Rupa. When the biggest culprit is in the smack dab center of it, meaning attention. How is this working? Am I addressing your question, you think? Yes, you're addressing it. I don't know that you've answered it yet. <laughs> how would you... Like it being answered if 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 that would be a fair question yeah. what i'm looking for and i think you're telling me that i shouldn't be looking for it mm -hmm. is that i'm looking for a spot in a cycle that this thing is going to go all the time and you told me that i shouldn't be doing that but i still don't know that doesn't help me to keep in mind what's happening what i'm when i'm applying sati and i'm having these feelings and mm -hmm. watching the process mm -hmm. trying to watch the process that i'm understanding exactly what's happening and why it's happening and that's because i'm not understanding the part about where attention comes in the cycle now you mentioned something very crucial you said sati the moment you have sati you have access to all things because you have access to wisdom Wisdom will turn the light, the, the torch, the, the, the flashlight onto what is taking place. I would start with sati, always, always, always. Look at, okay, I'm doing this. Let's say I'm perplexed about an issue. In order for me to be perplexed about an issue, I need to be dwelling on it for a long time. I need to be like that chicken sitting on the egg for a while until it hatches. I'm doing the same thing. What is the chicken doing to the egg? It is giving it its attention. It is dwelling on the, on the egg to make sure that it is there. And that's what we're doing. But you will never know this unless you have enough sati. Sati, mindfulness. Now, sati does not automatically, immediately bring, in, at least in the initial stages, immediately bring with it Dhamma Vichaya, which is Panya, which is wisdom, right? Which is the second factor of awakening, right? Sati, Dhamma Vichaya, Virya, Piti, Pasadhi, Samadhi, Upekha, the second. The second that we have Dhamma Vichaya present, it starts looking around. It's like you turned on the light in a dark room. And it's working and the light bulb is there the power is working everything's fine and you have light that's when we start seeing what is happening in the room where are the furniture how are they organized and that is where you can comfortably i would say look at the structure of nama rupa now you don't have to know all these branchings and this because it can be mind boggling, especially when you're living moment to moment, living life. If I am, and this is where the Four Noble Truths come in wonderfully. The very first truth, looking at what is taking place. Am I comfortable with this? Whatever I'm, I'm going through. Am I feeling pain? Am I feeling sorry? Am I feeling distress? Yeah. Okay. That it was, by the way, sati, allowing me to pause and ask the question. Okay. Don't stop there. 
look, probe deeper. And this is when sati becomes panya. Sati, we shouldn't lo just look at it as face value. We need to go and that's why it's called consistent, constantly being mindful. That is when it becomes a factor of awakening. So the moment you are doing that, Dhamma Vichaya appears in the mind, thanks to Panya. So it will not be, absolutely, it won't be seen necessarily the way you would like them to be as a principle, as a concept, as a structure, as a brick on the wall, numbered 17, for example, in relation to number 63 or 24, whatever. It's not going to be like that because your life has nothing to do with those numbers. It's very fluid. It's fast. Your mind is fast. So my job is to first sit down and understand what is my mind doing? Where is it? Is there dukkha? The very first question. If there's discomfort, for example, as you go deeper in practice, your mind will get to be, even without meditation, while you're sitting there doing something, sitting there on the porch, on a balcony, watching the sunset, your mind is so calm. There's not a thought. Not a thought happening. Sankaras can come in. What is this? This is unusual. What, what, what is this? We have to be thinking about something, it says. This is Sankara. Because it's habitual. Because that's what we've been doing all throughout eternity. What is this? What is this quietude? This is unusual. We have... That's when Sati comes and looks and attentively, carefully looks. Oh, Dhamma Vichaya says, there's nothing wrong. In fact, this is quite sublime. This is lovely. This is pleasant. How did you know? Mindfulness, attention is there. And the mind is calm. There's no fighting, there's no dukkha, because there's panya all throughout, observing, seeing. And when you see things, you will see things. You will not add on new layers, including the burden of the paticca samuppada. Yes, the burden of paticca samuppada and all these principles. These are just there as tools. It's like a rope swing that's hanging from a tree, tall tree, that when you latch onto it, hold onto it really, 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 really tight for dear life, holding onto it as you swing. But once you get right over the other bank, you need to let go and drop into your safety. But the mind has to be acclimated to this. It doesn't happen overnight. But what it does do is it likes to latch on to these concepts and principles. So my suggestion, my encouragement would be to not delve too much into these principles and use a tool that really works for you. So for example, the three uh, images, the, 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 the image of the three things like chanda, the roots of a tree, which is the enthusiasm, the wanting to do this thing basically. Then the trunk or the tree itself, which is the attention, manasikara, that is going to be magnifying, bringing more attention to the chanda or the enthusiasm, what we started off with, which materializes into the fruits of the tree, which are the flowers of the tree, which is the contact that we want to take place. Like was, when I was saying about when we want to experience things, it's not the actual seeing of the thing or tasting of the thing, but the feeling that we get thanks to the contact. Well, most of the time, the contact is badly placed. It's Ioni Somanasikar. It doesn't have the right attention. The, it doesn't have the wise reflection. That's why Lord Buddha said it's Ioni Somanasikara. Because we started from the wrong enthusiasm. Even the Dhamma at this point becomes a glitch. It, it becomes a, a, a ball and chain, if you will. 
I see it all the time. I remember the people who just want to hold on to this principle or this thing. And what difference is there now between your life as a, I don't know, software engineer, and now you're holding on to this as, as a renunciant or whatever? Who cares? How is this helping you, basically? Is this helping you? I don't know, Greg, is this helping you? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to listen to the recording a couple of times. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And I highly recommend um, reading, um, or, or I recorded this too. This uh, this week was a marathon of recordings of, of uh, Bhante Nyanananda's books. Um, uh, and one of them is, is um, all of them are great. Seeing Through is one of my very, very favorites. I was mentioning to a student the other day that if I were on a deserted island all by myself and I was given the luxury of having one single Dhamma book, what, what would it be? I said, Seeing Through by Bhante Nyanananda. It's so thin. It's like, I don't know, 18, 30 pages. So thin. That's recorded now. So uh, I, I, you know, it looks like a map at some, how many times I've drawn over it, underlined in the just notes and things. So I rec recommend that. Uh, also the um, magic of the mind, that's also recorded now. Um, highly recommend that because he goes into details about this, especially the chanda, uh, that which is the, the, the fervency, the enthusiasm, which is basically the spark. And then that dictates the trajectory of the attention, of course. Um, and from there, there it will be the, the contact that will be the resultant of these two previous ones. So he goes into detail of, of, about these, as well as Nama Rupa, which probably, I'm sure he will do a lot better uh, uh, job than what I, my meager attempts here have, have tried. So wonderful question as well. Um, any other thoughts, comments, questions, critiques that you might have before we close for the day? My encouragement is not to allow the mind to latch on to concepts just for the sake of concepts. It's, it's very tempting, it's very seductive. The more we get to know, the more we get to understand, part of the brain likes to hold on to these things. It might not like to go into nightclubs or to a bar or this and that, but now it can hold on to let's say this principle of the Dhamma or that retreat, or I want to do this, I want to do more. I know people now who are addicted to doing retreats, like, okay, one after the other. Well, it gives them a high. It's like uh, what I've mentioned before with, with cases with individuals who do the 12 step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, where they are trying to not just alcoholics, but any addiction. And uh, instead of it doing its good work with people, then the person who stopped doing the alcohol, taking the alcohol, now they latch onto the group meetings as the new addiction, meaning they would end up doing three, four, five of them per day when they're supposed to do one per week because it generates a certain kick for the person. It's another hit as they used to say um, so the dhamma can be a, another form of a drug if we don't know what we're doing meaning if we don't go back to the source what is the enthusiasm where is the root placed in is this wholesome chanda is this wholesome enthusiasm desire if you will or like devadatta for example buddha's own cousin who tried killing him more than three times and, and he died. Um, he had the intention of attaining to the psychic abilities. His enthusiasm was not well placed. He became a bhikkhu and all that with Venerable Amruda and Ananda, all these guys. 
On the outside, it looks beautiful. And he's even a student of Lord Buddha. But the, where did he start from? So let us look at our chanda, our own uh, enthusiasm point and starting point. And then now we'll, it will show us the att attention and then we will know what we are seeking in our living experiences through the sixth sense doors. What kind of pasa, what kind of contact I'm really after. He was after doing some psychic, you know, tricks on people appearing as a little boy in front of a prince to try to convince him to kill his dad, for example, which he was successful at. But then the moment we go against the Dhamma, we lose whatever we had gained up to that point from the Dhamma. The Dhamma cannot work against the Dhamma. If the heart is pure from the start, it will continue on its journey to final Nibbana. No, plain, no, no questions asked. Plain and simple. So we need to always check. I say these things right now at the end because it's important because I see a lot of individuals who have turned the Dhamma into another series of assets that they have, another set of titles and things. And that's ugly. That's showing so much disrespect for Lord Buddha and his Dhamma to the holy ones, to the Arya Savakas, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, bode well for the sasana's future. But to each their own, we have to practice our own, uh, for our own lives and, and our own evolution. And I think Mirko had said something. Uh, uh, okay. He was... Uh, having issues with the connection, no problem. Uh, so I'm glad that this, yes. Ante, thank you very much for your talk. I just have a quick comment to your answer. Um, I think what I'm getting from your answer is that attention, um, so long as one has a functioning mind, mm -hmm. attention is always there and uh, our job, if I understand it correctly here in the practice, is to not define attention in a clear way, but to, to see how it works and to guide it in the right direction. I think experientially that makes so much sense to me as we sit and watch the mind, attention jumping from one thing to another, and with Sila we're trying to guide mental action in the right direction from which everything else follows. So I, I can sense how counterproductive it can be to try to come up with a very clear definition as much as we would like to as to what attention is and, and, and hold on to that uh, consistently. Just hmm. wanted to offer that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to see um, if it is, uh, if it has ever um, happened where any of the principles that I have seen in the Dhamma um, was um, principles themselves as concepts, as structures, uh, as concepts, uh, as theorems, as formula, whatever you want to call it, were in and, in and of themselves complete. None are, none are. Uh, what I mean by that is it is all experiential. So in that sense, it is very right-brained. And this, you know, the right brain, left brain, you know, one analyzes, the other one doesn't. One is very colorful, you know, creative. That's, that's completely unscientific, by the way. Um, there's a lot of research done uh, with Dr. Ian McGilchrist and in, in, uh, I think in Oxford and um, who he has a wonderful book called uh, The Master and His Emissary. The master being the right brain, by the way. So it's about the relationships of these phenomena, if you will. Taking attention, for example. It's the relationship because the tone of it, the tone of the attention, and only the person can know this, really. But they have to be able to 
create some space without using too, you know, flowery language. Um, the person has to have enough mindfulness to be able to be grounded to see where their allegiance is. Allegiance towards this action. And where is it coming from? What is the starting point? What is the thing that sparked it? What is the, where did it start from? Because sometimes we might even engage supposedly on the outside in a good benevolent action. But then the outcome is rather weird because the contact that we extract from it, it did not give us the feeling that we were after. We feel empty, we feel dissatisfied. Now the mindful person with sati and panya will say, okay, why I did the right steps, what happened? And they go back to the source. Oh, I started with a bad, bad root, bad enthusiasm. It was not rightly placed. So if you approach it like that as well, you can really look at the attention. And if all else fails, look at this moment in your life. Are you really happy? Or are you pushing and shoving? Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling anxious? Are you, is, are you sitting uncomfortably with yourself? At least be attentive of that. The moment you are, then we can unfold like the layers of the onion. Why? Why? And then you start seeing where the attention has been placed. Most people who are depressed, more, most people who are contentious, who want to get into arguments so that they could end the argument, so that they could supposedly feel the comfort that comes at the end of the argument, everybody goes home happy. Most people don't realize that that mindset comes simply from the heart being very contentious in, inside, full of hatred. There's so much dosa there. On the surface, you're saying, or I'm advocating for the Dhamma, for example, I'm trying to prove a point so that we can go home happy, understanding, let's say, Paticca Samuppada or whatever the Buddha said. <sighs> but deep down, I'm actually after the attention is on me being correct, me pro proving to you that I'm right, you're wrong. Contentious hatred. Lord Buddha called it Vyapada, or the defilement form of it is dosa. That will never be apparent to the person so long as the person does not look with their own eyes and see the attention, their attention. The outsiders might be able to pick it up, to see, to even diagnose. That's why most people who are dealing with depression, when they are given tools of coming out of the depression, guess what? They want to still maintain the mental disorder. Even though when you lay it out to them, they explain it to them, they say, that's not true. I don't want to be depressed. Why are you saying that? I don't want to be unhappy. I want to be happy. Yeah, but no. Your attention is on wanting to be happy. But me saying that with a big billboard holding and showing it in front of them and projecting it on the screen, giant, he or she will not accept it unless the person sees where their attention is. And that is why it's essential for sati to be there by the person. Sometimes I've seen that the time factor plays a huge role in this. So, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a long way of, of saying I agree with you. <laughs> Sorry for so many words. I'm glad this is only once a week. <laughs> oh, I have the one later on in the day. Yes. Um, okay. So let us uh, call it a day and, and, and uh, let's share some merits. Now, of course, you, if you have any questions or if you feel like I haven't touched upon the answer, uh, reach out to me again and send me a message. And I'll do my best.
May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find health relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share in these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Be well and may the triple gem protect you, bless you and your loved ones. But remember the biggest protection comes from you. Where is the mind? And that's a good place to put the attention. Where is my mind? What is my attitude in this? Am I being affected detrimentally or in a positive way? Hmm. Am I feeling safe in my heart with this decision, whatever it is? And starting from there is a good place, I think. Try it. See which, which, which one works for you. Be well, and I'll see you next week. Take care.